normally me. This time it was you. Planned obsolescence. That's what it is. It's like my biggest pet peeve in the world. You know, those questions you ask me about being annoyed. Anything that makes planned obsolescence. That's that's what annoys me. <laughs> well, you need to bite the bullet and get a new laptop. What's stopping you? Get? Why are you not getting a new laptop? Do you know, it's it's... I hate the fact that I'm forced into it. That's what it is. It's like I've got my arms tied. My laptop was working perfectly fine. And I've got to say, you're actually the second person this has happened to. Neil Oliver was the first one. And I was like, had him waiting for 30 minutes because of my bloody laptop. And it's like, ah, oh, Apple, I'm being forced. I'm being like, strong we need to delve into this. <laughs> Being forced. So what's what? You explain that to me. I'm pack- and the reason I ask is I used to have this weird, you know, when you think back about things about previously about yourself. Maybe you don't, but I do. And I go, that was odd. That was an odd thing about me. I used to get, when I was when I was surfing, I used to get in the shower every day. Yeah. And the, and the shower was push button one, you know, and, and it would, on a timer, 10 seconds, 20 seconds, whatever, and it would pop out. I would only get out of the shower if the shower was still running. So even if I finished washing, <laughs> if the shower went off, I'd have to switch it back on and then get out because I had to be the one in charge of when I got out. Not the shower, I'll decide. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like it. It's crazy. No, you know what? It's the annoying thing of it all. That's what it is. It is like, so like you asked what's being forced. I mean, I don't know. I feel like being strong armed is almost being forced. Like, you know, obviously I'm not being held down and like someone saying it's life or death, whether you buy a new lap, but I feel like I'm being forced. So So this is tied into I your your general opinion on civil liberties, etc., which I'm sure yes. you'll come on to, right? I knew it would be. I knew it would be. I already saw that coming. <laughs> <laughs> so but but um just starting off then, so when I when I first connected with you you, I didn't realise that you were actually pretty busy that day. And you were in London at a uh, at court supporting Mark Stein. Yes. In uh, it was to do with, uh, well, the advocacy of free speech. Can you explain yeah. that to me? What was the day about? Why were you there? So it was a judicial hearing. I believe that's what it's called. I'm not really up to speed on what you know the legal terms and everything, but I believe it was a judicial hearing because he was going after Ofcom because Ofcom had said that he breached their rules. Um, And, you know, Mark Stein, um, I used to work for him. I used to pop on as a commentator and contributed to him once a week on GB News. Um, He'd had a couple of guests on that he'd interviewed and um, they'd given their opinion. And there was these orchestrated pylons from people on twitter who would basically you know put out a tweet saying right report mark stein he was on this channel this time this was the title of his program this is what he said now click this link go report him so they weren't even organic you know complaints basically it was a real pylon um from people and what happened was then ofcom went after him and um these they said that they had he had reached their terms um, and, you know, Ofcom, I don't know if they're hired by the government or, or but they, they oversee what goes on TV and now they're trying to oversee what goes on on the Internet as well. So, you know, this was definitely this is definitely about free speech and what he was able to say. And I didn't actually the court was so packed that actually I didn't get to hear his um his well, he wasn't defending. He, he he was going after Ofcom in this case for coming after him. Um, but when Ofcom went to defend themselves, I mean, it was crazy. The the lawyer said, well, we're not saying that Mark is wrong. Basically, we're not saying Mark's wrong, but what we're saying, and we're not necessarily saying it's misleading, but what we're saying is it could be harmful. And then the judge, you know, interrupted a couple of times and she said like you know if, you, if you're having a chat with somebody and then they talk between facts and they give opinion how often do you expect a host to keep you know chiming to say this is opinion and this is fact like how do you expect that conversation to go didn't really give a valid answer and then they said well and then they spoke about one of his guests and that dr naomi wolf and they were saying well we're not saying that Naomi Wolf was misleading, but we're saying it could be harmful. And so they said, and the judge again chimed in and said, well, hold on, wait a minute. 
you've called Dr. Naomi Wolf a conspiracy theorist. So I think you are trying to say she's misleading. And I actually, off Tom's defence, actually said, um, we're not taking a stance on whether a conspiracy theorist is true or not true or a conspiracy theory is true or not true so the whole thing the court erupted in laughter like this is what is this and um yeah and 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 she said basically like, the judge had to say look you might have to you know leave court if you're going to continue to laugh in court but it was like it was a farce it was just mm. insane what um what Ofcom were trying to do yeah one of the things is one of the things that seems to have become prevalent over the last X amount of years. I don't know. I don't know how many. I, I, I would. I would hasten if I was going to do, going to do a quick analysis on it. I would say. I would take a guess now that it was since since the advent of social media, yeah. right? Social media and smartphones that crossover. And something that seems to happen is um, you end up with these ambiguous terms thrown into law or rules or regulations mm-hmm. like harmful. Define yeah. harmful. How are they defining that? Right. Like, yeah, def- def- define harm, define harmful, and, def- and define like the levels of harm you're talking about. Yeah. What is valid, what is not, and so you got you got that. You've also got a problem with thing people like Ofcom, people like media regulators, where they are not caught up. They have not caught up with the way no. that people interact with media and the way they respond to media. So, so even just on a complaint basis, I'm pretty sure that Ofcom still has rules in place, like their their thresholds for action they will take to do with complained about things on television, for example. Yeah. I'm pretty sure their thresholds are based on how many complaints there are. Now, yeah. you and I both know it is so easy today to whip out whip up a frenzy of people, yeah. with lots and lots of complaints, than it was pre smartphone, pre social media. Yeah world but they don't seem to have evolved with it do you know how do you know how bbc are regulated by ofcom are you aware of this well i actually had a look because i wanted to make a complaint for something that was said by one of the doctors in the same way um that people have complained about mark because you know doctors so let's let i'll get to the point is that mark was talking about the dangers of the vaccines People had a pile on and went after Mark. So I thought, let me complain on the BBC about them saying the vaccine's safe and effective. I couldn't get to Ofcom. I had to complain to the BBC before I could complain to Ofcom. Um, Or I couldn't complain to Ofcom because the BBC handle their own complaints. So hold on. Why is Mark subjected to Ofcom's rules, but BBC can do whatever they want? Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, exactly. So they're the only they're the only broadcaster where they basically handle their own com- any complaints about them. They handle, they self review, and then any they uphold, they say, yeah, actually, it's a valid. That's a valid complaint. They have to refer themselves to Ofcom. It's and when a you joke. Look at, it's, it's crazy. It's, it's crazy. a joke. And then when you look at, but what Ofcom does have. On their on their figures is the number of complaints that be made about every broadcaster, including the BBC, that have come to them, and the BBC is like minuscule compared. Yeah. To, they've got like five percent or ten percent of the complaints everyone else has. Yeah, because they're not reporting all of the others. They're going, yeah, irrelevant, irrelevant. Irre- we dealt with it. Irrelevant, irrelevant. It's it's you know that is wrong. <laughs> and it's dangerous. And it's dangerous as well when you look at what they're calling harmful and misinformation. They're just you know, making up at the top of their head. So, you know, Mark's got into trouble because uh, the t- this was like misinformation, right? But they were able to go on TV and all these doctors went on TV and said, if you have the jab, you uh, won't get hospitalised or you won't die from COVID. If you get the jab, your chances of spreading it are like basically nil. If you get the jab, don't worry, it's safe and effective. All of these things... That was their opinion, but none of those ever got pulled up as misinformation. And even now, when we've seen... Two, so so the, my problem is that if you start stopping people from being able to speak freely and give, you know, different opinions because one doesn't go along with the government narrative and one doesn't go along with what Ofcom deem misinformation, if you can't speak both sides, then how can you ever... You know, what happens when the truth evolves? Like one minute they say masks are safe, then they say they're not, um, 
sorry, no one needs to wear a mask. Then they say everyone should wear a mask. And then, you know, it comes out that masks didn't do anything. But if you can't keep exchanging information because you're going to get in trouble for misinformation, then what's going to happen? Like, just like now they're doing it with climate change. And anyone that, and, and Mark's also had a lawsuit, um, you know, had a case about being able to speak freely about climate change. Because that's the next thing they're coming. If you're not with the government narrative and you don't believe that cow farts, you know, are causing flooding around the world, then you're going to be labelled as a misinformer and and have your things taken down. Yeah, the the problem is is that um, I, I see exactly the point you're making. I agree with you. Is that when because like COVID example and the climate change example and and though not COVID but climate change. Definitely is that like the right now it's very much still out for debate in general. Yeah. Right now, I, I tend to agree with probably what you think in that this has been blown all out of proportion and this is a lot of nonsense at the moment. Most of it is, and it's for people to line their pockets generally. It's like yeah. one of else, right? But I also think, uh, put your rubbish in the bin, use minimum waste, yeah. Recycle if you can, right? But but I go off topic here. The problem is when you're talking about freedom of speech and clamp down on free speech, those are the two great examples of it where you're not allowed to challenge the mainstream mm-hmm. narrative. And because those are two big examples of it, people just throw on right wing or conspiracy yeah. associate with it. And they miss the point that you're trying to make, which is this isn't about COVID. This is about that's an example of we were not allowed to discuss anything other than mm-hmm. what to think now what's good now is especially since we're an elon era of twitter stroke x is that it's very obvious now with a covid example it's very obvious now is that in that what people are trying to challenge with and getting prosecuted for in a lot of cases and in some countries getting jailed for in a lot of yeah cases, um is absolutely true like they know now that it causes injuries they know though that a lot of the stuff that was being said to force people to get vaccinated in lockdown mm-hmm. were lies they know it and it's proven yeah. And there's like entire nations which are turning around and saying, we're going to try and sue the mm-hmm. pharmaceutical companies or we're not going to fall in line with this um, WHO agenda um, as evidence of people realising. Whole governments, whole nations realise yeah. we were misled in some ways. you know. But again, people don't. People are so, we're so polarised, are so polarised by those two things. They're missing the whole point and that is, it may t- like the, the 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 clamp down on free speech now may line up with what you think. You may believe in climate change. You may believe in everything to do with COVID. The vaccination, the lockdown was the right thing to do. So you don't want to hear what other people. Right. But it doesn't mean they shouldn't be allowed to say it. Exactly. In ten years' time, it could be to do with an issue that you believe in, and it's going to be you not allowed to talk about it. It's 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 a crazy world exists where you you're afraid to voice an opinion, just an opinion on something. It is, and there's so many of these things now that they're trying to, you know, censor people for, for speaking about. And that's the worst thing, censorship, because we always need to hear uh, both sides. We, you know, the the people that were speaking out about the danger of lockdowns, you know, how masking isn't going to help necessarily stop the spread, how it's actually bad to keep, you know, to be unable to breathe the air out, especially for children, how it's going to affect the way children interact if they're not seeing their parents' faces or strangers' faces. All of these things, and then, you know, obviously people talking about the jabs and alternative um, things to make your immune system stronger, you know, for any kind of illness. All of these people got censored. So if you can't hear both sides of the story, how can you ever make an informed decision about anything? So I just don't think people should be censored at all in any kind of way when it comes to free speech and um you know obviously it's very different if it's you know really vile hatred towards something but it, when it's like very just simple common sense you're not you know you're not wishing for the death of somebody <laughs> when it's something like that you should be able to always speak and like you you know with climate change and and everything else actually i was ne- i'm i get called right wing or far right all the time it's the most insane thing because four years ago prior to this people would probably have called me a lefty i was living in los angeles i was living in america so i saw that people didn't have um you know 
free or government health care. So I was always advocating for, you know, people shouldn't go into all this debt in their lives because they've had a health problem. I was always like advocated that I'm like, I'm into saving the trees and, um, you know, like you said, recycling and reusing and repurposing things. I want a nice planet for the kit, but to start taxing people and saying, you know, carbon dioxide is the most evil gas on the planet when really it's what plants need to actually breathe and produce oxygen. It's just insane to me, but you're not allowed, you know, they're, they're starting to clamp down on that. And when you call out things like, you know, the weather chart, so 20 years ago, 20 degrees would just be like yellow and, you know, 28 degrees would be um, green. Now you see, you know, these charts where it's red, 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 almost black with danger for, for like 25 degrees. And you've got, it's like a heat wave in England, danger, red, 27 degrees. And I put that on my Facebook and it got, to, it got like a big whole misinfo warning put on the top. It's like, it's like nuts. I mean, let's say, let's say for a second, right, that, um, let's say for a second that actually there is a, a near term climate disaster coming. Let's just believe that for a second, right? The the way the news does things at the moment is they undermine their own they undermine their own stuff with it because to your, to your example even like last week I think what was it it was twenty six degrees on Wednesday Tuesday or Wednesday they did the did the heat wave the heat wave coming twenty six <laughs> degrees was it last week and America like on on X you see Americans is taking the taking the piss yeah the heat wave and like and the thing is that is that and again re, big red colors yeah twenty six degrees heat wave. The problem is people are old enough to remember. You only, you only have to be one year old. To, uh, one, well, not one year old. You only have to remember one year ago. Yeah. <laughs> what? Even I know 26 degrees is that hot. Last yeah. year was 30 odd. It's, it, it's just it's just total, total nonsense. It undermines themselves. And that, I don't think that's like conspiracy or agenda that they've got there. I think that is, again, it's a problem with the way like social media and the information age has moved and the news outlets have not been able to keep up with it. So now only all they're aiming to do is clickbait, yes, outrage, yeah. drama, yeah. make people scared, make people talk. And and this is the habit they've got into. And then when you tie that into we know that they are very easily influenced by yeah. big powerful organizations, mm-hmm. either government governmental or not it makes for a perfect storm and you, all you get is nonsense right yeah and then you add into that the extremists on either the left or the right or whichever agenda either the anti-climate change or the one on same or the anti-covid or anti-vaxxers and the ones who are on board with it they all in their efforts to validate what they think they believe in without giving it any actual tri- full thought they also whip up bullshit yeah and they just chuck bullshit around what, like what you're doing it's so hard i think these days to try and understand what you're reading or seeing is sh- should i how much how quality how much quality is that, that I'm, I'm, I'm reading or, mm-hmm. or, or, or watching how much attention should i pay should i listen to what this presenter is saying about this clip of i don't know biden or i don't know rishi Sunak, or what this random x account is saying that has got ten thousand retweets or whatever about some Undercover reporters just caught someone on on tape being racist, apparently, and clacked them. You know, that so. to me looked like a complete setup, like entrapment. That was that 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 would be like me dressing in red, going out pretending I'm a Labour support, a uh, Labour canvasser, because it's canvasser. You got anyone can be a canvasser. I could be a canvasser. I could go pretend to be a canvasser for uh, Labour. I could knock on somebody's door and then they don't or. To, or, or their camera bell and they don't answer and then leave this like sh- really shitty message like or yeah. racist or homophobic or transphobic or bigoted message on it so they can hear it and then they can then blast that out and then they can go oh this late but it's a setup it's a, it would be a setup it wouldn't even be it wouldn't even be real and this guy was obviously it's so obvious he was like entrapped into something well th- well again the thing is with this is that again social social media X in particular is as we're talking so people will listen to this probably next week unless they get out unless they get out on the weekend. But you know, the for people who are aware, this is the Andrew uh what's his name? I can't remember his name. Can't um, remember. The, <laughs> uh, it's literally broken in the last in the last eighteen hours. Right. So at channel four I've captured uh, an undercover report I've heard in Clacton, one of 
Nigel Farage's Reform Party UK's canvases being very racist, very racist remarks and whatever else, right? Within within 24 hours of that story breaking, we've got new information. He's even been spoken to. So it turns out this guy's an actor. Um, uh, and so straight away that triggers all of the cons- all of the inverted commas conspiracy theories or all of the possibilities of what this could be. Like the most nefarious one could be Conservative Party or Labour Party have paid this guy to go in and yeah. The other one could be, it's Channel 4 have done it. I think those are, those are unlikely. The other one could be, it's a journalist doing it to try and get a viable story. Yeah. Possibility. Or In all of those ones, I saw a problem with it being that it has to involve the actor. It's a, it's a significant amount of self-sabotage because it's got to be an element of like character assassination on himself to be willing to do this. Yeah. Which means if that was me, I'd be like, you're going to pay me oodles of money here if you want to do this or i'm really thick and i don't realize but as i was saying to you off off air before this gb news have got older and have spoken to him and he has said that um he has said that he wasn't he hasn't been paid by anyone he was goaded into making those comments by the reporter and he said in the full clip he is, you'll, you can hear him talking in his normal accent. He says he's well-spoken. On his website, he says he's well-spoken. Obviously, the clip that was shared of him being racist remarks sounds like quite a common accent. So he put that on, being goaded by, and it was, in, a, in his words, in a jokey environment. So he wasn't even saying it seriously. So this clip has been recorded of him saying it. They know it's, be, and, they, and they've released it out of context. This is Channel 4. Knowing they've released it out of context. Knowingly done that. And then release well, it as if it's an actual canvas who've been actually racist when they know otherwise. That, that should be jail time for people. See, and this is the thing, right? Is these kinds of journalistic tactics that have been going on for ages because when I used to model um, and I was a page three girl, I just remember on the news of the world on Sundays, there would always be some big story. Um, and it was usually involving the fake shape who is now in jail Because he would do this thing, he would entrap people, he would set people up. So what they used to do with celebrities, because celebrities were the thing everyone's talking about, now they're doing it in politics. Although he did do it in politics, I think he entrapped uh, Fergie, um, Sven Goran Eriksson, um, rugby players, sports stars, footballers, models, actresses. The fake shake, and he just did it with Talisa. That was the last one. And then they ended up calling out the fact that it was entrapment. They've gone to this elaborate setup and scheme to get Talisa to, um, I don't know, supply drugs or something like that. But it was such an elaborate scheme that they put up in order to entrap somebody that the fake shake actually um, went to jail for it. And I know people that were set up by, by him um, whilst I, you know, whilst I was back modelling in the two thousands, so these kinds of entrapment journalistic tactics have gone on. Setups have gone on. People want a picture of something. You know, they'll go up into a protest and they'll hang a flag of. And then no one will see. It will be up for a one second. And all they need to do is get this, like, you know, say it was a Nazi flag. I think they did at the lockdown protests. I don't remember. I was loads of them. I don't remember for a second anything like that. But someone just puts one up, takes a picture, puts it in the paper, and that's the whole new narrative. And these setups are going on all the time. Even when I was modelling, I used to do like I used to work, sit with my PR person and come up with something like an elaborate story of what, like, what we can we do. So I'd sit by on a sun lounger reading a self help book and then sell the pictures to, you know, one of the papers and. It's just a picture that tells a story or a snippet that tells a story that's going to make a journalist some money, a photographer some money. In my case, it was me some money. Um, But that wasn't harming anyone. These are really harmful things. The fake shake was a harmful setup. And all of these journalistic tactics that entrap people and coerce them into saying something ridiculous and then taking it out of context or taking jokes out of context you know, all of that kind of stuff, it's it's happening now more in politics. And it's actually, it's really disgusting. And, you know, there was another thing I did. I did the, a show called The Housewives of Cheshire. Um, and what the producers loved was things that would split the audience. They're like, this is great. This will really split the audience. So that was probably five years 
five years ago, so a year before COVID, right? And I just remember during the lockdowns, during the push for jabs, during the push for masks, I just remember watching the TV shows, the news, the breakfast shows, and went, Jesus, this is what they use. These are the same tactics that they're using on a bloody reality show that's supposed to be entertainment. But what it does is it gets people talking about it. The TVs go off and it gets everyone talking and it gets everyone arguing and it gets that program. on. Did you see so-and-so on This Morning? Did you see so-and-so on Jeremy Vine? Did you see so-and-so on Talk Radio? Did you hear them? And everyone's talking about it. And they're all just happy because everyone's divided and arguing over the most ridiculous things. And no one's in the middle just talking a little bit of common sense. Everyone's just, and that's what they want. So all these tactics that are employed within entertainment and showbiz are now being used to manipulate the general public. But on news and breakfast shows, things that are supposed to be factual they're using tactics from entertainment things to yeah. manipulate these people in what they watch and think, oh, okay, this is where I can get my information from. You never watch The Housewives of Cheshire and think, I'm going to get my information from a bunch of those idiots that are there bickering. But suddenly you'll, you will think, I'll go and get my information from the news or the daytime talk shows. But it's, it's the same thing. It's all done the same way. Well, and it's and and it's at it's at our expense, right? Because you've still got you still got people who don't understand you now that the news, what it used to be, is not what it is these days. Right. They don't understand that the news, the news used to not be so hard done by when it came to generating revenue for themselves. The mm. news used to have a captive audience for people who are looking for news. News, yeah. They don't understand that these days the news have got to compete with social media. And the news have got to, be, got, to, got to compete with independent content producers like Mark Stein, you know, and 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 everyone else, like myself, for example. And they don't understand that they have to compete with that, which is why the standard of what they do has gone yeah. down. The pan. Um, and yeah, it really is at the expense of people who don't understand that. Like I, I've got, I'm sure you have, I've got close friends and relatives who will. They're, they're, you know, like you used to be able to pick up a book. You still can do. You can pick up a book and you can, you can read everything you believe in a book. You can, yeah. Everything you read in a book, you could more or less believe, right? Sort of. Depending on which book you read in. Or it's, yeah, sort of. The news used to be able to do that. Yeah. Go, yeah. Okay, I get it. These days, it's not that. I have every article I read. I'm like, hmm. <laughs> doing a deep dive analysis and go, how much potential I'm going to pay this? Yeah. yeah. Really I've got close friends and relatives who don't do that. They read a headline, the BBC, with an article, and they, they believe, I'm just picking on the BBC, just because I need pop it in my head. <laughs> um, and they believe everything they read or see, yeah. or the opinion that's been put forward, or the spin that's been put on, or the way the story's been presented. To your example, think back to the, I think it was something to do with anti-racism protests in London a couple of years ago. Do you remember? And I think, I think the week before, there'd been some other protests turned violent, and the news were all over it. And then this anti-racism process in London happened, and, that, and they described it as a mostly peaceful protest. Do you remember this? Well, I remember the BLM protest in America, and there were literally flames above from the arson behind saying mostly peaceful. I will, I will never forget that. I will never forget mostly peaceful, and there's a building on fire behind this reporter, I think in Minneapolis or whatever, one of the... the yeah, so the same happened in London. The same, so I didn't realize that happened in America. The same happened yeah. in America, exactly the same uh, line, mostly peaceful protest. This is only two or three years ago, though. Um, now, regardless of what the thoughts are on BLM, I, my thought is why, why does the media, why did whatever the, the first MSM outlet to break a story, why would they not want to present the actual story? Why would they not want to say anti racism protest? turns violent because it was yeah. big it was a big part of it turn violent it wasn't the entire thing it wasn't everybody but it was significant it was there were uh there was police getting battered yeah there was stuff getting set on fire it's not mostly peaceful this is bad a mostly peaceful protest is the ones like you saw i think it was an anti the first big anti-palestine protest which unfortunately happened it was last year during, it was November, like Remembrance Week. I think it was Remembrance Saturday or Sunday. 
I didn't agree with them doing that day. I'm obviously I'm ex-military, but yeah. they did it. Nothing happened. Like, yeah. There was no problems whatsoever. I think the only problems came from extreme right wing EDL type morons who were there tr- looking for a scrap. Apart from that, it was fine. That's a mostly peaceful, if not entirely peaceful, protest. March, yeah. protest, whatever you want to call it. Why? I don't understand why they, they, they have to bullshit other than they need to get clicks, need to, to your point. Yeah. It's an interest to divide. It because, is. And- do you think that's just to get people arguing online? I think a lot of it is. I definitely think there is a lot of it. I think there are narratives that need to be pushed, like at the time, you know, to do with COVID. And also, I mean, of course, I'm against all racism. And it's even insane that I have to caveat it with that. But I remember the BLM um, riots and stuff, because when they were happening in America, because I'd lived in Los Angeles, um, I lived by a place called Melrose. and. BLM had gone through the, the, the protests and they, they looted shops. And these were like independent shops. These were cafes. It was BLM and Antifa. So I'll elaborate on that a bit more. It was, they, they were all independent stores, like, like cafes, coffee shops, sunglasses shops, little boutiques, little restaurants, the nail place owned by some little Asian ladies that I used to go to. All these places got looted or set on fire. And there were a lot of people rationalising it and no one talking the actual truth. Now, what was crazy is I was saying how corrupt the organisation BLM is at the time. So ignore what it stands for, because, you know, I think most of us, if we're decent human beings, do not want to see racism, you know, want to treat everyone equally. But what was going on? It was it was a movement with paid agitators, and there were people, you know, a lot of the lootings and the fact was it wasn't even black people doing it or black people part of BLM. It was like the Antifa lot who were white liberals causing so much of the trouble, and they were like, you see, black people saying, "Don't do this. Do not do this in our name. Do not do this," and they were still doing it. Or, um graffiti and BLM all over places and 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 the black people were saying to what do not do this and so it was a whole thing to divide and then there was just so much corruption involved with raising money and the people you know paying for it all just weird things were happening like piles of bricks were showing up where they knew there was going to be a protest in order to you know Oh, bricks, let's chuck them. Like, just all these things were happening. And I think there was a whole narrative with BLM to actually cause trouble and divide people up a lot more. Yeah, I th- the, uh, the, see, there's two, there's two pieces to this, isn't there? You can talk about, like, BLM, the organisation, as you're doing there. And there's BLM, the movement. Like, I'm with you. You know, if there's a, if there's a, if, if, if something needs to be done to, uh, decrease the level of racism right and there shouldn't be any racism but unfortunately that exists and it will always exist to us in a residual amount um then it should be done um but the blm organization well as we know i think the founder has been prosecuted millions, yeah. millions embezzled i think the founder yeah and it just undermines the whole reason behind it all and then you get the opportunity to jump on to the the right uh the the protests and they turn the protests yeah. and go loot in um and and then and then it all goes completely pear shaped, undermines the whole movement. You get yeah. a situation like we're at now where actually a lot of people when you when you hear the phrase BLM, a lot of people don't think positive, they think negative. They think either or neutral at best, or they think negative yeah. about BLM the movement. Yeah. Not black people, BLM the movement. Yeah. And it's kind of the same as happened a lot with Pride, because you get the bad aspects of these big movements that cause resentment. Yeah. Society and go too far in certain ways, in some ways, and cause problems in general. And then you get the embezzlement, and then you get the violence, yeah. and you get anything else that goes with it. And, and then, then you and- get the DEI, the whole people like just doing it as a virtue signal. Like when you suddenly see all these companies, these corporations in America and the West changing their logos to the rainbow one, but actually where it's really needed where gay rights are really needed, like in the Middle East, they don't change their logos. They keep it. They keep it the same because it's all just like 
you know, it's all a bit of a virtue signal. It's like, oh, that's just, we, we can change our pride flags because we can. Whereas really, you think, you know, Mercedes, BMW, um, and all these companies that are displaying these, re- you know you can in America, you know you can in the West, why aren't you doing it where it's really needed, where rights are really needed? And, you know, pride just used to be these gay people walking down the street saying, we just want to be able to walk down the street holding hands with our partners, you know, nicely dressed, holding their banners, work respected people. Now you have people on floats, men in floats, in dog outfits, with their thong, like little thongs, um, and some gimpy kinds of outfits walking along. And as you said, completely undermining what it was all about in the first place, which was, and so I have a lot of, um, gay and lesbian friends who are just like, you know, this isn't what it was meant to be about. Like it's been hijacked by all these woke companies and these, you know, woke liberals that are nothing to do with what we ever were jumping on the bandwagon of it all. Yeah, there are nuances to it. I think it depends. You know, I, I I see the I see the value in the pride movement if it's done properly and if it's not if it's not an overreach. And I see the value in it if people are part of it for the right reasons. You know, I've seen that recently where I, where I where I work, and I think they get it like nailed on. They're not over the top with it. It exists to. They have so we had Pride Week. That's Pride Month, isn't it? So we have some Pride stuff at the office. And but it's not totally overboard. It's just just the right level, just to so people know. If Are you saying you didn't go in the office in a little thong and dog mask? No, 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 <laughs> yeah, that you didn't that, do that. Yeah, I mean, you see that happening in schools in America, don't you? I mean, all the drag stuff and all that. It's just complete overreach. Again, this goes to that you need to have balance and you need to know yeah. what, exactly what you're trying to achieve. The BLM movement, that organize or the organization when it's set up. I had no reason. They had no goal. They had no. no goal. Didn't know what they wanted to achieve, and it, and it ran away with itself. All that money. Where did the money go? Yeah. And it guaranteed, it happens in other other um, initiatives. Guaranteed. Mm-hmm. Guaranteed. Where is the money going? Where is the money going? What's it? What's it being used for? But um, again, circles back round to because these organisations are also good targets for polarising mm-hmm. and getting attention media wise they're great they're great targets and then they can also be politicized yeah you know um for wh- whether left or right target and the politicize and positive or negatively look at exactly what's happened now in the uk all of a sudden rishi, Sh- rishi sunak and keir starmer who have never touched who've hardly gone anywhere near any of these issues like migration like um gender ideology being taught in schools and things like this all of a sudden they're talking about it, and it, it's like front and center of their of their um of their mind going into in, in the election. You, they can't fool anyone. You don't care. You no. you've used it as a tool up to this point, and now you're changing the way you're using it. You know, uh, to 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 win over votes of people who they think are right of center, and and in the much the same way as the media are just very obviously of very low grade, low quality, low integrity. Yeah. Group. The politicians are, and it's so obvious. They don't realise how obvious it is to people. Um, I think that's the thing. I think a lot of people are seeing it now. I've always hated politics. Like, you know, as I said, people might have called me a lefty before. Now they call me far right. But the reality is... It's nuts. The reality is, is I've actually never voted because... I can't stand any of them because I think they're all absolute liars. And I get, it's funny when people start, you know, sometimes label me as like, you know, I commentate on political stuff. I don't, it's like really kind of the social aspect, which should never bleed into politics, but it has. And that's the thing. Um, It's like completely bled into it. So I do find myself commentating or speaking about things that are now a little bit, have been made political, which is also, you know, kind of nuts to me but you know I've always found them to be like like seat for self-serving liars in politics and all these things that they do you just find out there's so much cronyism and they're backhanders to their mates for contracts and deals and 
you know, work that's going on, the amount. I mean, I wish people would look into it more. And I think people kind of have because they've seen the scams with PPE. But this has been going on, you know, forever. And I really think people need to, you know, look into that more. But I do think that this has open people's eyes a lot to what's actually um what's actually going on and, and what I've thought for like you know decades really. Do you, do you know funny you should mention that do you know I've just realized that none of the parties are talking about making a change in um if they get into government and that is exactly what you just said. That is putting controls on how politicians can make money from backhand uh, agreements yeah. with companies because they all do it and they've been doing yeah. it for decades. America have been doing it for even longer and they have much more advanced, which is why they got like they got our problems, but magnified. Yeah. Like ten years ahead of us and they're going down the pan. And we're gonna yeah. go the same way unless we do it. And none of the parties, not Labour, not Conservative, not Reform, not Green, not Lib Dems, any of them, in the manifesto is saying we'll clamp down on politicians being able to line their pockets with dodgy deals in government. Yeah. The reason they're not is because they're all at it. Every yeah. single one of them. And it has to be one of the most important issues and uh, concern issues to Joe Public. Not being mentioned. Not being mentioned. I hadn't realised until, until he talked about it then. It's one of the main reasons politics doesn't serve the people anymore. Because they can line their own pockets so easily, I think. So, and so easily. And people are like, oh, well, you know how. And it's not that they're, you know, necessarily giving a stack of cash. But just, like, look at... Look at where the money goes to so that, like, you know, we've seen it with the PP and that'll just have a look. How many of their friends have contracts within like building HS2? How many of their friends have contracts for the roads or for building houses or for these immigration centers? Like how many people are getting rich? Like, oh, well, you know, and there's, then you find out there's been all these contracts sent out with there's no tenders for them. They haven't compared prices with anyone. They've not put it out to other people. It happens to be their mate's company or a friend of a friend's company that are now involved with building or making or buying or selling something that the, with the, the, the government needs and, and, you know, and the prices for it as well. It's just, it's, it's crazy and it's out of control. And, and the thing is, it's not government money, is it? It's our money. It's our tax money. It's all of our money that we work hard for and give to them to help us. It's going straight back in, you know, some of it's going straight back into their pockets. And we've seen it now. And when we talk about like this transfer of wealth, that is how it's happening. Um, you know, money to all their friends. Yeah, uh, it, and it's not an unusual thing to be doing. You know, everyone, I think everyone knows someone or does do it themselves if they're in a position to be able to strike up a deal, make a bit of money for themselves. I mean, construction industry, prime example, right? They're yeah. All, get a contract, give it to your mate's company, get a backhand for it. I get it. I get it, whether you're doing it legally or illegally. But in government? should be no. It should be jail time. It should be jail time because, to your point, it's using taxpayers' money. And what it also does is it influences the politician to make a decision or a vote or votes in government or policy changes in government based on not just on what their people in their constituency want, which is getting less and less and less of a fax these days, but how much money or power they can accumulate because of it. What is the likelihood of them getting richer in the future because of it? You know, it's... uh, it's, Again, the political system, I think, has not evolved to the way it needs to evolve these days. Totally, totally unfit for purpose. You know, I'd like to see ref- reform get in just yeah. because it's Labour and Tories and shake the tree and shake things up yeah. ready, for the, ready for the next election. Yes. Get some new party in, hopefully. But even then, I think we're going to still have this problem. Of, there's, a, there's a word for it, isn't there? I can't remember what the word for it is in politics where you lie in your, lie in your pockets with it, but... I can't see it changing drastically unless the whole political system's overhauled, which isn't going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> However much we hope or wish for, yeah, no. I mean, it could. It, we could be worse. We could be dealing with Biden, Trump. But did you did you see any of the clips of the um, debate they had? I did. I woke up and I saw. I think Russell Brand had posted a bunch of clips, and I saw some others of the and I just first of all I had to actually ask is this real right so I'm looking at it and I'm thinking hold on a minute are these real before I start reposting them did this happen because it's so unbelievable like and then they think god okay so who is running the country because this guy cannot he's no fit mental state he 
it's undeniable he has something like dementia or Alzheimer's. Like, you know, I, I and I, I've joked and I've joked for a while that, like, you know, if I'm ever nervous about speaking in public or, well, I don't speak in public, but if I come in on a podcast say, all I have to do, look at one of Biden's videos and just know I will never be as bad as that. And that's the question. And that's like an insane thing that I'm even thinking that. But, you know, you watch it and you just think, what is going on? You say it's undeniable, right? But to the point we were just talking about polarisation and, and news media being influenced by big organisations and government. There are there are news, there are American news out this morning and high figure personalities, big, big personalities like, you know, household names across the world who this morning, are trying to argue and say that Trump is as mentally compromised as Biden and or that Biden is, is awesome and he's totally fit for the job. I've seen C- CNN maybe say it. The, le- the last that. one sort of calling was Mark Hamill. Like, yes, oh, yes. A post about how awesome Biden is. How are you going, what, what have you watched? What debate did you watch? Granted, I, I, admittedly, I haven't watched a whole debate. I've seen clips of it clips. from multiple sources. There's no clips of Trump bumbling through his words like Biden has been doing for his entire, almost his entire thing. And yet you've got actual news organizations and actual people who should know better and have an ounce of self-respect for their integrity and what they think. Bullshitting. Obvious <laughs> lying. Obviously, it's so obvious. It's this- so obvious. <laughs> and I didn't so- understand it. You're right. There have been people that have tried to defend it. And it's nuts. It just, it's one of those things where you just think, like, am I going to be mad? Is this actually happening? Like, what world am I in? And, like, you know, I was like, you know, I use a lot of expletives as I was thinking this through, like, I've got Tourette's or something. Like, what the fuck is going on here? This is crazy. And then crazier that you're defending it. Like, I cannot. Uh, comprehend this for a second and again it's starting up in the uk and the thing is is that when when it becomes this obvious now people start thinking back to other things that have happened and going huh do i need to realign yeah what are you thinking about that and i think that that is what happens and i that is definitely what happens because i think i had a moment you know during the lockdowns where you know as i've said i've never been left or right and i've you know, lean this way or I've leaned that way or what people would say I did because I just thought how I thought, not aligning myself to anybody. But I did think, I did remember seeing a clip um, and it ended up being a whole clip of what Trump had actually said about the those um, South American gangs, the MS-40, what's that, oh, what's that gang? The really dangerous gangs, um, um, I said MS-14 uh, gangs and, you know, illegally coming into the country and, you know, what he called them. And I remember hearing that he just said that about every single person from south of the border. And I was like, oh, my God, they've completely taken that out of context. What else have they taken out of context? And then I kind of went backwards and I had that moment of like, God. I have really, like, taken in a load of shit from the MSN and believed it. The MSN and and, and believed it. Like, you know, and I had to re, you know, readjust my thinking a little bit. Um, So, yeah, I think, you know, I think it happens. And I think the only thing is, is they're making it so obvious that people aren't this stupid. I mean, some are. God, like, there'll be some people, like you say, that's going to defend Biden till no matter what, but there'll be a lot of people that think, God, what is going on? What is going on? Let me just look back a minute. You know, if you've got any kind of sense or brain cell or crit- bit ounce of critical thinking, you'd be like, hold on a minute. What else have they been bullshitting me on? Yeah. Yeah. Well, how else have you been misled? I, I, so the BBC, right, if I look at the BBC website, just as an example of what we just talked about the last 15 minutes. So. Um, that the the reform canvasser being racist. So we know now, and it's been reported by GB News about this guy. Everything we just we just talked about. The guy himself said, "I was saying it jokingly." And it's been taken out of context. BBC homepage. 
Rishi Sunak condemns racist term used about him by Reform UK campaigner. That's, head, that's one headline. Another headline, Reform UK campaigners caught making racist slurs. They are not publishing the fact that no. this guy's been spoken to and he has said it was taken out of context and he was goaded into it by the reporter. And they're not saying it. They're not saying it. So there is there is like the vast majority of the population in the UK right now today, right now at this moment in time, probably still think this guy was an actual horrible racist individual making these comments and they don't know and a lot of those people won't ever realize that no. that it was something else because they won't see it because they're just doing bbc or just doing sky news it, it is terrible and we're going to go into an election like that with uninformed people or people who you know people who don't realize you need to go to two or three layers down into assessing news and information and stories that come out that you didn't have to. It literally takes more effort. But you know? what's scary is, I'm sure in school we all learnt about what propaganda was. I mean, I remember, yeah. you know, <laughs> history lessons. What is propaganda? Well, the news did this and and this and that was censored and da 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 da. And this is propaganda. And so, you know, how are we not able to see propaganda now? Mm. How are we not able to notice? I mean, not us, you and I, but probably the people watching this show because they'll already have the open minds to want to seek information elsewhere. But, you know, how are the people that just sit there every night just yeah. taking it all in and just letting this propaganda wash over them without thinking, wait, hold a minute, what actually happened? How did that happen? The problem is it's, it's uncomfortable to be in – I find it uncomfortable to be sort of understanding that this is the situation. I don't want it to be like that. I want yeah. it to be e easy for me to navigate through the world. I don't want to get caught in a position where I think yeah. everything is propaganda because it's incorrect. I don't want to get caught in a position where every conspiracy theory, in inverted commas, get thrown up, that every single one of them is true. I don't want to get caught in that, you know, because that's a really easy trap to fall into. I, like, I'm yeah. sure you know people. I know people who everything the government says is a lie. Everything the news says is a lie. Yeah. Everything it says about COVID is a lie. Everything it said about climate change is a lie. And it's not the case. Yeah. Like, a lot of it is. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's very true. You know. How do you, how do you navigate it? How do you, how do you sift through the, the bullshit conspiracies from the real ones? Do you know, I think I have a very good gut feeling of things. Um, and I also have to use, you know, my real world evidence of what I see going on around me um, as well, because that's another people, you know, a lot of people will listen and take in what they're seeing on the news, but don't look at what's happening in their everyday life. Like how true is this? Do I see this happening? Are people just falling down in front of me um, with a cough and dying on the spot? You know, this kind of thing. So for me, I do that. Um, and then I look at diff lots of different sources. I look at, you know, I ask questions, people smarter than me, people, um, you know, people that have maybe expertise in particular areas. I'll ask other people questions. I also want to hear what everyday people think of things, you know, people not in my line of work or necessarily people that don't have um all the same views about every single thing as me i want to hear different things and then also sometimes i have to just cut away from it all and take a little break and just do yeah. nothing and just like get out because otherwise it can be very very overwhelming with all this like constant information mm -hmm. um, and as i said like you know i have a gut, lot of gut feelings and instincts about things which i physically feel like, you know, when things don't don't seem right. So I do have to also, you know, take a bit of time out just to give myself some peace and me time so I'm a lot clearer and less annoyed and angry with everything. Yeah, yeah, it's difficult. I try and do two things. I try and make sure that my – where I'm getting my information from is, is not all people I, I are aligned in my thinking. Yeah. And that is hard because that means, like, take X, for example, that means following some people who I cannot stand. <laughs> I cannot stand, but I need those opposite perspectives at my feed so it can get me thinking. And the other way is um is uh 
especially with the conspiracy theories are concerned, I try and always think that um, often it's the simplest ex- explanation is the right explanation. Yeah. You know, this this Andrew Parker, isn't it? Andrew Parker, this 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 uh, this guy who made the comments. I couldn't when people are saying it was Channel Four paid him. I th- I couldn't believe it. No. There's too many holes in it. It's like too difficult to do. Yeah. I would like to believe it. <laughs> I would like to, but it's so diff- it would be so difficult to achieve. Um, and I, I try and do those two things, but um, it's so it's just too stressful. I would almost like to be as ignorant as I was before. Yeah. Like because like you, know, I haven't always paid attention to politics. I mean, only over the last few years, it was kind of COVID that kicked kicked into yeah. it. Um. Only over the last few years, and I almost, I almost wish I, I wasn't doing it. But it's imp- it's important to have conversations about it for sure. Yeah, you know for sure. Um, if you had to choose, would you have Rishi or Kia in power for the next? <laughs> oh God! <laughs> What's that on. mean going around? Do you want Rolf Harris or Jimmy Savile to babysit you? <laughs> no. <laughs> this, this doesn't. This doesn't mean that you're advocating them for them to be PM or you like them. If it had to be one of those. Okay. Two, okay. Which listen one do you to my think logic. This is going to be my logic. Okay. This is not going to be one that anyone's going to be happy to. But this is my logic, right? So I guess what people say is, due to my beliefs, they would see me more on aligned with the conservatives. However, personally, I don't think. Richie Sunak and his little merry gang are anything like real conservatives. They're just conservative in name, right? They're not real Tory. They're not real conservatives, you know, the Tory party, right? So let's get that established. Um, So they've been in power. They've messed up this country. They were disgraceful through COVID. Boris Johnson has been a ridiculous joke. Never, ever once tried to attempt to get peace in Ukraine. Never, ever once did any of that. So I can't stand them. I also cannot stand Labour. I don't think they stand for the working people. I don't think they stand for the people of Britain. Um, But I'm going to say Keir Starmer just because he is so awful and the country will end up going down the pan, which I don't want. It's going to affect us all. But it might make real conservatives actually behave a little bit more it might put them in check let's just say that it might put them in check because we know that if they keep running the country they could keep run, the conservative party will just the tory party will just run this country into the ground i mean labor are going to be awful our lockdowns would have been worse with labor um god knows we might have had mandates and stuff like america did and all the liberal democrat led countries like australia and canada and it could have been that worse with Labour, but in a way, I just think it's not, people aren't going to wake up unless it just gets a little bit more effed up. I just, it's just hell, it, it's all hell. And I just don't know how, if the Conservatives, well, they were Conservatives won't get in, but if they did, I just don't think they would make any good changes. So maybe it will just give them a kick up their ass if someone else did. Now, that's my long-winded answer. <laughs> Sorry. No, I, I, like, yeah, oh, I get what you're saying. Yes. It's sad that we're in that, it's sad we're in that, in that position to think that. I think that Labour are equally, almost equally as, almost as equally complicit yeah. um, for the country going on the pan over the last four or five years mm-hmm. as Conservatives. And the reason I say that is because you, you've got to have a strong opposition. Yes, got a strong opposition yeah. to police to police the the uh, uh, party in power, and Labour is so weak. Yeah, it's because they won't commit to anything. They won't commit to anything in terms no. of, especially on the ideology front. Uh, just a- anything of significance, they won't commit to it, which means they're so weak. And uh, and again, not pulling the government up on backhander backhander dealings. I, mean, I think they made some they made some noise about it. Maybe trying to get some stuff done about it. it didn't push hard enough. No. Which, there should be people in jail, in my opinion. For, yeah, yeah, for Liberty. You know, and they just they're just so so weak with it. That, um and it'll be the same when we go into if the Labour win, and they're probably gonna win. The Conservatives, they're in such disarray that they're gonna be a super weak opposition. Yeah. I mean reform reform I like only because they are gonna shake the tree and give the opportunity, the space for a new party going to the next election. I yeah. Call. My only concern is that they end up getting backfilled by by conservatives, by Tories, and they turn into the same monster 
that the Tories are now. And that is an idea I've pinched from someone else, a guy called Gaz, who I do another podcast with. And he mentioned it to me. He said that, like, he made the point that reform of, they form really quick. There's such a short amount of time between now and the election that most of the candidates that have got in are not real politicians. They're like, no. it's just the way it is. When I was, so this is about similar to, are you right for time? You're yeah, right. yeah. This is similar to, so what I'm happening now is reminding me a bit of the Brexit campaign in a few ways. Um, one is that the Brexit start, when the Brexit party started up, they were kind of, they weren't taken that seriously. They ended up with some lunatics like in the party, which weren't real politicians. And, and one of them was a friend of mine who I interviewed for episode number 50 of my of, of this podcast. And then I got him back in four episodes later because in that four episodes time, which is about four weeks, he'd gone from being, he's an ex-Special Forces guy, he's a conservationist, like goes and does like Shark Week in America and all that. And then within the space of four weeks, he was a member of the Brexit party and an MEP. <laughs> what? what happened there? Because he'd had a conversation with Farage at a party one night and put yeah. him for this, what the heck has gone on? It's kind of similar to that now. Reform, they're doing better than they expected. Kind yeah. Of. Oh Christ! Um, and the other similarity is that when Brexit happened, people were buck. Joe Public, the electorate, were they were the what they thought the outcome was going to be of Brexit was based on what their friend circles and social circles were thinking. Right. I knew it was going to be probably Brexit. I knew it was like definitely close, but I was pretty confident it was going to be mostly Brexit. I thought most people were just unhappy at the time. Like yeah. now, people yeah. were unhappy. It was hard times then. Yeah. Not as hard as it is now. It was hard times and people wanted change, right? And that was happening at the same time. And that was pounced upon to bring about the votes that resulted in Brexit. Similar is happening now. Yes. Right? Those people being whipped up to get in and vote for something different than the bullshit that we've got yeah. from the conservatives. But back then, similar to now, is people are in this. A lot of people are in this bubble where they think, "Yeah, Labour conservatives. Everyone's everyone's going to be Labour. It's going to be fine." Anyone who votes for reform are just racist. No one really likes reform. It's not the case. It's so lazy. It's so lazy to, to say that. I mean, when you look at the candidates, they've got like. There's Muslim candidates, there's Sikh candidates, there's a Muslim, like, backing reform. Um, you know, it's it's just such it's just such laziness to just go, right, everyone who votes for reform is racist. You know, it's just, it's ridiculous. And, and you know, I think it's just, it's just very lazy. And actually, it shows how desperate the uni party is, really, that this is, this is all they've got now. But but unfortunately, what's going to happen? So my first thought with this Andrew Parker guy, when I was someone was talking to him about it this morning, my first thought, my first response to it was, well, unfortunately, reform is seen as the most right party we've got at the minute in terms of legitimate party. They're, what are they? Right of centre, I would describe them as right of centre. Right, other people describe them as far right and extremist. Which yeah. But unfortunately, because they're the furthest right on the spectrum, you they are going to attract the EDL types. Yeah, they are going to attract those arseholes who literally think people are less than them because they've got a different skin colour. They are going to attract that. And that's my first thought with this canvasser. I thought this is an actual racist. And unfortunately, you're going to get these people supporting because they're morons. And, they, and who think that reform is a racist party because they're anti-immigration, anti-mass immigration. You know, it's going to happen, unfortunately. But I am really hoping that is a big shock, you know, next week. Um, uh, again, to shake the tree. Something yeah. needs to happen because we can't keep going on. The next five years are going to be a nightmare. Yeah. Be a nightmare. I'm like dreading it. Um, you know, I've got kids. I'm going to be maybe growing old in this country unless I decide to leave, which is a strong possibility. Yeah. You've got to see how it goes. It's just getting to a point where I'm like, I don't know. But it's like, I don't even know where you could go in the world now because it all seems to be, you know, the West just... There are places. So... so I've got a friend who, guys, I just mentioned, he has gone to Bulgaria. He went last year. He's got the advantage of no real ties here. Him yeah. and his messages have moved to Bulgaria. Because in his words, it's sort of 10, 15, 20 years behind, where the, 20 years behind what the UK is now. It's the UK 20 years ago, which I think 
was really good. Hey, that was a good time. I was in my 20s. That was a great yeah. time. Bring it on. Bring yeah, it exactly. on. I mean, that exactly. was a great time for me. Exactly. And, uh, yeah. and he, he's quite enjoying it. He's quite, I went out and visited him. That's quite good. There are places to go, but you got to have sticks and leave. I don't want to leave. I want to be no. in the UK. I want us to be governed properly. I want us to have our freedoms that we should have. I want, you know, I want the the country not to be overburdened by too many people, unexpected too many people too quickly, which is what's happened for the last yeah. 20 years. I want the school system to be good. I want the health service to be good. All this stuff has just got neglected while people in power have lined their own pockets. And unfortunately, that's mainly what it is, I think. Yeah, no, I think so too. I think so too. And they've, you know, and they have to, you know, I just don't know the desperate measures they will go to in order to cover up for how they've destroyed the country. Like, you know, all out war, maybe, you know, because there's, <laughs> because they've really, really, really gone and destroyed it so badly that how can they distract anyone and take anyone else's mind? off it other than you know something catastrophic like that so yeah. but i'm like you i don't want to leave this country i have three horses now i'm not up hard enough moving back from america with one i'm not hard to fly them all around different places yeah. you know and, and this is my home and i i've lived elsewhere for 17 years and i just want england to be how england should be and back how it should be because you know i love it it is one of the I'm always happy to be home. I've been all over the world and I can honestly say I'm always happy to be here and, and home. So I just want this place. I want this place better. Like I think most British people do. Yeah, I agree. I love, I love the UK. I want it to be, you know, I want to, I'd love, I want to stay here for life. I love it. I love the people and, and I wish it would stay the way it could, but or the way it was, I should say, but it's not going to happen. Question. Are you, I know you say you don't vote. Or you haven't voted. Are you going to vote next week? I'm not going to yeah. ask you who, but I'm going no, to No, no, I am. Who. I am. Absolutely. Oh. I would, I, I always, well, I, I've said it. it's all over my, it's all over my thing. But like you, I want the apple, I want the trees to be shaken. I want the uni party out. And if one of the awful, most hideous uni party people get in, which I think they will, I want there to be a really strong opposition, at least some of the seats, to say no. You know, and to actually oppose them, because like you said, Labour didn't oppose the Conservatives and their awful wrongdoings the last few years. We And, and if, if Labour get in, we need somebody really, you know, a few strong seats just to really be opposition and say no and be a voice of reason and a voice of logic for all those people that, you know, yeah. can't say how they feel in Britain. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think um, Farage would be, uh, you know, he is a very hateable character. He's Marmite for a bunch of different reasons. I interviewed Farage actually on your um, three years ago. He was, he was, uh, it was good. To, he's actually a big, big fan of the military. He does some informal military tours and stuff, which surprised me. Oh, wow. Uh, he, like him or hate him, what I will say, what you can say about him is he, he will not toad. He will not toe the line in terms of what he's expected to say or not yeah. say, and what game yeah. he's supposed to play with the media. You know, he has been the victim of smear campaigns yeah. for I don't know how long, a misrepresentation by the media for I don't know how long. What ten years, at least ten years, has got to be going back. In fact, longer than that because Brexit was twenty twelve, was it not? Yeah. Oh, I was living in America at the time. Twenty twelve. I think twenty nineteen. We got. I can't remember. Anyway. So he knows, and he won't play that game. You see, I just found a clip of him this morning talking to a Channel Channel Four report that was interviewing him and saying, "Hey, what about these racist remarks?" And he, he turns around and he says, "How about you report about the Labour candidate who's been called yeah. saying things and saying, and you won't report it? They won't report it." No, and I I saw that, I saw that, and I think you're very, and that's you know, I think an accurate representation. And I think the good thing is this isn't new to him. These smears and these hate campaigns and. So he's used to him. He's already had to defend himself um, and he knows how to do it and he knows everything that's coming um, at him. So, I, you know, it's great to, that he's able to uh, kind of like, you know, shoot down all these incoming attacks. Yeah. And I, yeah. And, uh, you know, I've no doubt, you know, he's a businessman. He's also in it for other reasons. Um, but I think with him, there's a real opportunity to, 
re-baseline the culture in and around, well, in the House of Commons, the way those things go about, and those discussions and debates go go, go on, and how um, how politicians engage with the public and what public expect, I think. And I well, think actually since him joining, you know, what was it, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, I really feel there's been people who have felt, uplift, and like there's almost hope, like, you know what, we are going to have some opposition to whoever gets in. We're going to have somewhere, someone up there speaking a bit of common sense and speaking for the people that can't speak up for themselves. So, you know, there's there's a little bit of renewed hope, I think, within people. Yeah, yeah I think so. It's just a shame it's had to come to this for, for, it, uh, for it to be the case, you know. Um, but I am a little bit excited for the election, a bit of excitement. <laughs> Before, before we close it off, I, I don't know if you've realised, but so, our, well, you know this, our election is on American Independence Day. Right, yes, yes. The American election is on UK Burn the Government Down Day, 5th of November, Guy Fawkes Night. I did not know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's got to be some kind of symbolism in yeah. there somewhere. Like, you know, I love it. Anyway, um, It's been a pleasure. Thank you. For Thank time. you. Thank you for having um, me. Is there anything we want to cover that we haven't covered? I think we've done it all. I think so. How, would, how can people follow you? Is, is X your main platform at the moment? Yeah, I got thrown off uh, Instagram. I am on Instagram, but you know what? They threw me off 2021 because I was showing people how to be non-compliant. They didn't really care when I was moaning and ranting. But when I started posting pictures of myself with my sister drinking coffee on an outdoor park bench when, you know... You're not allowed to sit outside. You're not allowed to walk around with a hot drink because that counts as food. Um, I was or walking into a shop without a mask. That's when I got shut down. So I am on Instagram as Lani Dowd. Um, I can't use my full name on there, but I, it, honestly, on there it's just like me and my garden and my horses. If you want to see outside of my ranting and ravings, it's that. Otherwise, Twitter, Milani Dowding. I highly recommend. I highly recommend. <laughs> X, not Twitter. X. 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 Love you and God bless you, Lon. Listen, it's been a pleasure. And um, thank you for your time. Thank Enjoy you. The Enjoy the weekend. Enjoy a nice weather. And uh, I'm, I'll look forward to seeing your commentary on the next week over the election. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Bye. Bye.